Hello there and welcome to Successfully Depressed, and I'm your host, Carrie Finsan. This show is all about helping solopreneurs navigate mental and physical health in life and business. Today's guest is Jeff Carlston, a remarkable individual who embodies the roles of a father, husband, explorer, and dreamer. Jeff's extraordinary life experiences range from being a collegiate coach to a Peace Corps volunteer, an educator, and a mediator. Throughout his journey, Jeff has had the privilege of working closely with diverse groups of people, including gangs, professional athletes, CEOs, Buddhist monks, and individuals grappling with depression. His unwavering purpose on this earth is to guide others towards profound experiences of love, compassion, and unwavering optimism. In this thought-provoking episode, we delve into topics such as coaching with grace, surmounting life's obstacles, understanding internal external identities, and embracing a life driven by curiosity, compassion, and kindness. Tune in to gain valuable insights and be inspired by just profound wisdom and transformative perspectives. Now let's get to the interview. Welcome to the show, Jeff Carlston. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, we were connected through Matthew Rolnick, someone that we both know. I've known him for maybe 10 years. You've known him for quite, quite a bit longer than that. I think you met in grade school, as the, the legend goes. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I'm going to send him a picture and another buddy of ours, Lee, um, from back in the day. And then we took a trip to uh, the Kentucky Derby. So I have sort of this young, young three of threesome and then this older threesome back. So I've known, I've known Matt since probably third grade. Yeah. So it's been, he's one of my best friends and a good guy and really appreciate him connecting you and I. Yeah, it's great. Uh, he, I read his LinkedIn recommendation for you and he said that you've been on as many adventures as Huckleberry Finn. (laughs) (laughs) I do remember him saying that he is, he is a wordsmith, isn't he? Yes. Yeah, definitely. So I, I thought that was, that was pretty fun and everything. He connected us because of this podcast kind of focused on mental health for, you know, kind of individuals and solopreneurs and, and such. And with your coaching background, he thought that'd be good for us to talk. And I definitely am interested in learning more. That's why we're talking today. And with your division one head coach experience, you know, at the elite level coaching there's lots of ups and downs with that. How did you get into coaching originally? Like, tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, originally I got actually got hurt playing college volleyball. I'm from Minnesota, and uh, during my time um, healing my my hand, I uh, got asked to coach a club team, and I did that, and that was awesome, and had a great time. And to be completely honest with you, Carrie, it just sort of just kept the universe kept putting me in the space to coach, and so. I was fortunate enough to be a volunteer assistant coach at the University of Minnesota under Mike Hebert, who is, has since passed, but was my mentor and you know my guy. So I was a volunteer there. I actually went overseas. I was in the Peace Corps working with youth gangs and working in the School for the Deaf and got um, asked to start a national program over their volleyball program. So I did that with a great group of people in Belize and still some of my best friends. So got to travel all over the world um, through volleyball. That was not my intention um, at all. But again, volleyball, the universe found me and, and threw me in front of another group of awesome people through the sport. Came back and got asked to coach at a small division two school called Concordia University St. Paul. They were Oh, and 22, their first year in the, in the <laughs> division two ranks. And I said, I can, I can't do worse than that. So I took that job and, uh, was making $18,000 was intramural director and was having a blast. Clearly I was single and didn't have any kids, but, um, we built that program up, got to be top 25 in in the country in those three years and was fortunate enough to be hired at Ohio university here. And was here for five years. We had a great run, top you know top 50 in the country, Division One, which was uh, a pretty cool experience. And then went over to Ohio State. I was there for 13 years. Um, you know, raised, started our family. You know, um, really blessed to have been a part of that. Um, I was let go there in 2019, right before COVID. We hadn't, you know, we didn't make the tournament for three years in a row, and 
you kind of know when you're getting when you're getting into that level that um, especially at Ohio State uh, after that third year you start the the seat definitely starts getting a little bit warmer um, and so anyway that that happened right before right before COVID and that was you know really really hard um, you know you start figuring out oh man my identity is really tied into what I do um, and the reality was I'd been coaching from a place of fear um, and not love and not authenticity for quite a while because I just felt that pressure um, a lot. And it wasn't so much the pressure, it was just, you know, the, man, uh, what have you done for me lately? And the, it was a, it's a great league, and I didn't really handle that as well as I would have liked to have in some ways. So in the end, I always joke that um, I don't know if I would have broken up, but when when we broke up, me meaning Ohio State and myself, I was like, yeah, that's probably a good thing. <laughs> so um, COVID hit and went over to uh, went over to Colorado and homeschooled my three boys, which which meant a lot of skiing, an amazing year, considering it was COVID, and then start up a business epic journey leadership, um, which has been awesome, and we'll talk some of that, I'm sure. And uh, then Ohio University reached out to me. Um, and uh, my family and I decided to come back here and have been here for about 18 months. So it's been quite the journey, but I would say the universe has just kept me, kept saying you need to be coaching volleyball. So um, love it. It's, it's really cool to be able to impact young people, and it's, it uh, brings a lot of our variety. I'm a little bit ADD, I think, and I like that, like that. So you never know quite what the day is going to bring, but it's been it's. I've been really fortunate to be uh, be able to do this for a profession for so long. Yeah, I mean, to have the experience, especially coaching for a D1 program and for a big university, I can only imagine how stressful that would be. I'm just, I mean, as a you know fan watching sports, you're always like, you're just a, you know, you're the couch expert <laughs> and, oh yeah, this this coach doesn't know what they're doing or this, this player doesn't know what they're doing yet. They're like, um, oh, they're actually in the professional level and you're just sitting on your couch, you know, eating some food or something. Yeah. There's definitely some of that. A lot of people think they can do your job better than you, but that's, that's kind of the cool thing. You just, you're just out in the public and you know, your, your success and or failure is literally on a scoreboard for everyone to see and judge. So, and that's, you know, it just comes with the territory. I, I didn't really mind that to be honest with you, but you're absolutely, you paint a good picture. <laughs> yeah. I read an article that you actually wrote for, I believe, volleyballmag.com. So it's volleyball mm -hmm. magazine, I'm assuming, mm -hmm. uh, in November of 2020. And that kind of, you mentioned this briefly, but you kind of open up more about coaching with fear and just kind of trying to rethink what it is that you really want to do and kind of, um, your you are your job that's like your your persona to a certain extent especially when you when you've been coaching so long and you just get that at that level so i thought it'd be interesting for you to kind of dive into that a little bit deeper about kind of what you learned from that uh, and any takeaways and how you've leveraged that to you know create this epic journey company and so and continue to coach volleyball yeah sure i appreciate you bringing that up um yeah the article was cathartic in a lot of ways it was called grace and coaching it's it got i was really really humbled by how many people reached out you know from the beauty of the internet and social media is is you know boundaries don't matter so i had people from all over the world reach out um that had connected with that article and essentially it was you know the ability and need for us to show grace um and it's obviously focused on it was written to the coaching profession as a whole, but as I've subsequently moved on and worked with Epic Journey Leadership and a lot of men in particular, but women as well, you know, I think the higher up you go in whatever you're doing, the, the lonelier it can be. Um, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a solitude that comes with, um, you know, being a leader in a lot of ways, and whether it's a CEO or, um, you know, the principal of a school, um, superintendent, CFO, whatever it might be, head volleyball coach. Um, and so I wrote a lot about that, the experience of, of walking out the door after being told for the first time in my life that you're not, you're no longer wanted here. Um, the, the you're not good enough uh, voices definitely um, were raging. And 
but there was a moment and I wrote about it in the article of just there was a moment of peace in some ways. It wasn't like oh things happen for a reason and da da it's, it wasn't that. It was just um it was a weight that had been lifted uh, like a brick house that had been lifted off my shoulder as I walked out the door and I just I I called it grace. Not necessarily the religious form of grace, although that certainly comes into play with a lot of us, but it was more just the letting go of that ego and so many things of having to. And, you know, I think a lot of us, I realize that I think especially men, we do, 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 we do. We we're always need in motion and we rarely, that gives us no time to be um, and to take, take that moment. And the universe had given me the opportunity to be and it sucked. <laughs> it was like, um, and then COVID hit and, so, but I'm, as many things are in life, you know, retrospectively, I, I can look back and it was one of the best things that, that could have happened to me um, in a lot of ways because it allowed me to start an epic journey leadership. It allowed me to, I, I'm not afraid. I don't tell people, oh, I was let go. No, I was fired and it was pretty abruptly and it was pretty, even though I'd seen 30 other coaches, head coaches let go, it was pretty, unex- it wasn't shocking, but it was surprising. Um, and in the end, I, it gave me some opportunity to really reflect back on myself and how I would handle that stress and how I handled, um, you know, my identity and how much of it was wrapped into being a coach. And, you know, coaching is a sport where you give yourself like you are away from your family. Um, I have three little boys and, and you're recruiting and you're gone most weekends. And, and then all of a sudden it's over, um, you know, be able to sit back and go, okay, what be curious and compassionate and kind are the three words I like to use, especially the word curious. I use that a lot, like with my players, with myself, with my clients. Just be curious and not punitive because the immediate response is, I suck, you suck, well, I'm not good enough. And anger, frankly, um, anger towards the others, you know, whoever that might be. But the reality was for me, that article was cathartic in the sense that I, I needed to take ownership for my part. Um, cause the world wasn't going to sit here and have a pity party for me. And, and I had to, I had to grow from this experience. And so, um, you know, I'm 53 years old. It was the first time I was ever let go and it was soul crushing, but also soul, um, rejuvenating in a lot of ways, but it's taken time and I certainly fall back into it, but I've, I'm able to use that experience to help others now. And I will tell you the most incredible sentence to ever come out of most optimistic came from one of my mentors who said it was actually jerry lynch who is an incredible sports psychologist and has written lots of books he works with steve kerr i got fortunate got to be able to connect with him and he said you know what jeff i think what a gift you know to be able to now you can speak to an entire population of people that you couldn't have spoke to spoken to two weeks before the people who have been fired, but also the people who have had their identity just blown away in a second because one other person didn't think you were good enough. And I was like, that is the most optimistic thing I've ever heard in my life. But 100% true. Um, And I share my story and I don't hold back. And I've found over the last year that that's been really, really powerful and transformative for other people. Well, what I like about it is you put yourself out there was, you know, it, it's fearful to do that in the first place. And I like what your mentor t- told you about how this is actually an opportunity, you know, don't look at it as, you know, okay, one door, you know, closes, other one opens. If you look at that scenario, then you're able to communicate what a lot of other people are feeling in the coaching world. And there's a, obviously a lot of coaches from, you know, little league on the way up. So when you're in, you know, probably in high school, starting in high school, it gets probably kind of a little bit more intense and then college more intense. It's just like each level that you go, it gets more intense and the larger organization that you play for. So I can see that as such a huge benefit to that community and why people did reach out, you know, in support or also maybe just to talk to you and say, Hey, I've, I've been there too. Yeah. You know, and that's where it's nice to feel that you're not alone in that. And so I think it's more important for people to communicate those things out loud. After you did that, it was probably, I'm assuming it was 
let's say scary as well as was it, was there a relief off your shoulders? Like, okay, it's out there now. Hopefully <laughs> this will, this is a good thing. Or was it more like, Oh, why did I do that kind of thing? Yeah, no, that's a great question. No, I mean, I, I mean, in, in our profession, everyone, everyone in the profession knew that, that I had been fired and you know, it's a pretty small community, but no, like I said, it was, it was very personal. I didn't write it for others necessarily, but I kind of did in the sense of, you know, I think other, I know other people feel what I'm feeling. And the cool thing that's come of this is that, you know, now with Epic Journey Leadership, I can really relate to CEOs and, and, and I can, and I think they can relate to me and other leaders of, you know, I've worked with professional athletes. I've worked with leaders of all walks of life because it's, it's really, it's a different it's a different stage, but it's the same thing. It's the same issues of, you know, solitude and who do I talk to about this pressure I'm feeling? Because if you're a CEO, for example, first of all, you don't really want to bring this stuff home every night. Like it's family time and how do you set, and we talk about balance and balance and balance all the time. And it's almost, it's such a catchy, you know, almost white noise. But we do know, especially, you know, that, that you, you don't want to bring all of this home to our to our, our wives, our husbands, our children. And it's something you necessarily don't feel comfortable talking to people you manage um, that, hey, I'm struggling, I'm this, I, I feel this pressure. Like that's not something most of us are going to do. And then you think about, okay, well, who else can I talk to? And you think about other CEOs and especially in the corporate world, they may use that against you. And so where, where do you turn? And the reality is, is most of us in those positions turn to nobody. We absorb it and we roll up our sleeves and we grind and we work. Um, we do, right? And that's not sustainable. And it's been really cool um, through having, like my mentor said, having gone through that, I know what it feels like to have 5,000 people in a space and you lose and feeling that pressure, you know. I also know what it feels like to win in that experience. And so that's one of the cool things about coaching is that the highs are really high, but the lows, man, they will bring you to your knees. Um, but my ability uh, to use that story and connect with, you know, CEOs and organizations and helping them develop culture, but also helping the leaders, because they always want to start up top because that's where the pain is. That's where the, that's where the person who's probably got the most on their plate and is most alone and I know what that feels like. So I've, I've really enjoyed this, this part of my life working and coaching leaders in other areas outside of sport. I really enjoy it. And, and I bring, you know, we have a group of guys that I've been working with for two years, male leaders around the country, and I'm just starting up another group here in the spring. And it has been transformative, the impact and the, and the need, <laughs> the desire for, and this is a men's group, to be able to, you know, share stories and be around other people who kind of get it. Um, so it's the cool thing that I did not expect from writing that article and getting fired is, is, is how the ripple effects go way beyond college coaching and, and tie into really everyone's humanness that's ever felt, you know, this sort of pressure and, and it can be a father or a mother that's the pressure of trying to keep your family together and raising children. I and mean, that's freaking hard. Um, but we just don't talk about it uh, nearly enough. And so it's been really cool to be someone who um, that's certainly part of my purpose is to create space and opportunities and experiences for us to do that as people. There's a lot to unpack there. There's a couple things that come to mind for me. One is just some it relates to me at when I had a small startup mm -hmm. and you know, I talked to my wife a lot about a lot of things and way too much really <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't really know, you know, who to talk to and I talked to friends and everything. But when you're, when you're in that headspace, you don't really know who to talk to and people around you don't typically know what you've got are going through unless there may be someone who has had a company or, you know, so similar, like your peers. So that's kind of like the point of this podcast is kind of help, help, help out your peers right. with, with that. And the other thing that kind of 
that I want to unpack from everything that you just mentioned was how I totally agree with how men especially, or at least say most men kind of bottle things up and don't really show their emotions on their sleeve. Um, and so for you to have this program to kind of get men together and kind of talk about things and share those experiences. And so, okay, well I'm going to share this experience. And then after I hear something from this other person, then that other person down the line maybe really feels comfortable with sharing something that they've never shared to anyone else before. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's really important to show that you can be vulnerable as a, as a man, that we all have emotions and bottling them up is the worst thing to do. And that's what a lot of us uh, do instead of letting them out. Tell me about kind of with this upcoming class that you have, or is it retreat? Is that how you, that's a group. It? It's an eight week group. Then yeah, I'll talk more. I can talk more about that. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm kind of interesting and kind of, you know, you know, if someone wanted to sign up for this, what does that look like? And, yeah. you know, um, if that'd be great. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, my company is called Epic Journey Leadership, and I started a group. Um, uh, it was called Epic Dudes. It actually, is called Epic Dudes. It's been going on for two years, and it's a group of men, and it's been really powerful. And I've given them multiple opportunities to say, "Hey, if, I, I want to make sure this is still useful." And I mean, these are very successful uh, men in their own in their own rights, and they've continued to want to do this. So, I decided to, and and it's sacred space. I mean, I think I, the word I think the word vulnerability is almost like fingernails down a, down a chalkboard for men because it's such a, a bit of a catchphrase. And so what I, what I talk about is this, like we get together and we'll talk about, Hey, what are some things that fill you up? What are some things we'll talk about, you know, some triggers, things, you know, what are, what do we do when we're, when we're feeling pressure, you know, ultimately once, once that door is open, um, and you can call it vulnerability if you want. I, it's just, frankly, guys sharing stories. I mean, we're just telling, being authentically talking about, like, the challenges of being a parent and being a CEO. Like, how often do we talk about that, right? And it's so, it becomes very, very informally authentic. Uh, and the power that comes from this, I find, is super simple. It's just, well, I thought I was the only one going through this because the irony of all of this um, is that I've talked to hundreds of men now about these things and just part of them, some have been this course and some haven't, but there is a universal truth that, that this is important <laughs> getting together. Cause we, we, for the most part, feel like we are alone. We feel like no one's going to understand and we don't have a lot of, um, role models in our past to, to, say that that's kind of BS. And once you get a group of guys together and we create a sacred space and I started off, I'll talk about, you know, I'll start off by sharing my story and then, you know, someone else will say, okay, well, yeah, talk about their, their relationship with their son or, or something they went through that was hard. And all of a sudden now you got it going and it's just, and it's fun, you know, cause it's not, it's not so much, it's not therapy, but it's therapeutic, right? I have my, I have my background is, I have my MSW, my master's in social work, so I, but that's not what this is. It really is me bringing people and creating a space for leaders of all walks of life, and we will talk about, you know, how do we level up? And there's always an action plan, like, okay, what are we doing? I'll partner up two, two guys from the group, and you guys are going to talk about, um, you know, how you were raised and, and how that, what are some good things that, that you t you've taken from, so your, your experience being raised in your family and what are some things that maybe aren't serving you well that you're, that you want to break, you know, you want to break that pattern. For example, myself, I was raised in a, uh, with a, in a place that was very, um, like I just didn't enjoy being home a lot and it was, you know, very, um, never quite sure what was going to happen with my dad. He was never abusive. It was very intense. Um, didn't deal with his issues that he's had growing up. And as a part of that, I just, every time I got, I got out of the house. I just wanted to leave. And now having, that's where the Huckleberry Finn adventures come in. It sounds like, Oh boy. Well, there's, I think that's more <laughs> of my traveling, but essentially, I mean, it's a group I work with one-on-one -on -one with, with CEOs and I work with small groups of men and we just, 
I help them. Here's where you are. And I can help be the Sherpa or the bridge to help them lean in through, through sharing and experiencing and giving them some ideas and direction, getting them maybe a little bit unstuck so they can, you know, flourish, whether it's physical or it's mental, emotional, or it's just within business. Um, you know, I think it's, I've seen some incredible results with simply getting people to lean in and talk about kind of what's really going on and some, some maybe not so, not so easy stuff to talk about that once the doors opened, um, really you start seeing, seeing some positive changes. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's, it's easier for me to give someone advice than obviously to take that advice for myself. And, and my counselor, you know, talks about that. It's like, you know, what would you tell yourself? Like, what would you tell yourself as a kid or what would you tell, tell yourself as a friend and maybe record that and play it back? And, you know, and so it's, it becomes a little bit more powerful because when you are in your, if you're in your head all the time, then it's really hard to, you know, fully process things and you kind of get that rumination. You're stuck on that hamster wheel. Right. And, and I think what's nice about coaching and, you know, I see a counselor and seeing a coach and having a counselor together, there are two different things, but it can be very beneficial. Uh, I've had the privilege of interviewing an ADHD coach, a trauma-based coach. And it really, I always thought about coaching more as for when you're in sports, mm -hmm. you have a coach, but then it, I was thinking about it. And as I interviewed these people that, wow, actually it makes a lot of sense to have that, that coach or that, that leader, or that mentor to kind of help guide you along the way, just, you know, get out of your head and like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. This thing that you, you, that you're suggesting as a mentor, and then you have someone to follow up with every so often about something. Right. I think you just need that little push sometimes. And just that, that other little, the other voice to kind of help you, you know, get on track. And I can tell from obviously your, your long career as a coach that you learn how to deal with so many different situations. And as, as a coach, especially of college students, excuse me, that takes a whole nother element. So you're kind of, uh, maybe in some ways, a, you know, a father figure too to some of these kids and you kind of really, they're growing up. It's a, you know, it's an emotional time of their life. They're maturing as, mm -hmm. as, as people becoming, becoming adults. So can you kind of dive into when you've coached you know, students over the time, um, you know, some of the things that, that you as a coach have done and kind of learned along the process of, this is what's really helpful this in mentoring these young youth of a, of America. Yeah. Yeah. No, I hear you. <laughs> well, I think, you know, you, you, you can't take social media out of the equation anymore. And so what happens is, you know, in a nutshell, and this frankly happens with CEOs and it happens with adults, but I think when you tie your identity and who you are into things you don't have control over your external, um, the, you know, things, you're, you're, you're unanchored in, in, a, in the ocean, so to speak. So, for example, a lot of our players come in and they've, they've never had a B, you know, so their identity is I'm an A student. And then they get a B in, you know, biology, which is no joke, right? They get a B and all of a sudden I've had play, they it really they struggle with it because they're no longer an A student because they got a B. That's, that's very real. And you also have, you know, identity of, you know, all the players that come in and play for play at a division one level like we are, we're, we're likely the best players on their team. You know, they've never sat. They've always been the stud, if you will. And then they come and there's 18 of those in, a, in now in our gym and they may not start right away or they may have a, you know, a sprained ankle or they have to grind through the identity of, of not being a starter. Right. And so this, this can tie this into relationships of, you know, I'm so-and-so's boyfriend or so-and-so's girlfriend, and then all of a sudden you're not. And, you know, so I think one of the things that I've noticed, and social media, by the way, just throws gasoline on this fire of, I'm not good enough, I need to be this, I have to do this. Um, and it really is tied into identity of, you know, getting, getting our identity and tying our identity into the external instead of the internal, the extrinsic instead of the intrinsic, right? And so we try, and we're trying to undo 18, 19 years of this, by the way, by the time they get to me. So a lot of times, the first time they ever quote-unquote fail is in our gym, meaning 
you're not starting or you know you're spraining an ankle for the first time and so we have a lot of opportunity to help to be the person who's in front of them as the head coach especially when they first fail and uh I love that frankly and so you know we do a lot of journaling we do mindfulness work we do meditation at the beginning and ending of a lot of our practices um we do things outside of every Wednesday we do we spend basically an hour on leadership and um going through a book and 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 walking through that it's almost exclusively tying in with the mental psychological and spiritual spiritual aspects of being a student athlete and then we always tie it into like what are you gonna do outside of this like you can't just not show up if you're when you're a parent like you you have we have to be willing to be uncomfortable and that's hard (laughs) that is a a hard (laughs) sell right and so i think i enjoy coaching and i decided to come back to coaching because i love that part of it um and i love being in a place like this where i feel like we're not so far removed from our student athletes that we can do that and we do a lot of coffee and, and do stuff outside of outside of the gym, outside of my office, and talk about life. And um, and so, yeah, I think a lot of it is just tied into this identity that is reinforced through social media that, one, I'm not okay, I'm not, I'm not good enough at X, Y, Z, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not tall enough, I'm not fast enough, I don't do this, I don't wear the right clothes, I don't, uh, da, 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 da. And, yeah. you know, that is, that's what these, the young people are getting and that's all they know, right, is is being blasted by how many likes they have and, and insta this and insta that. And so without sounding like a huge old person, you know, I think that we take that into take that into place, but then we work on, okay, let's slow things down, let's talk about anchoring identity into, you know, our spirituality or who, you know, being a good friend or being a great teammate or being resilient, being an artist, you know, these things that we actually have control over. So so much of their lives and our lives are necessarily not in our control. And COVID showed this, you know, to the world, like, man, if we didn't, if we didn't know that life was impermanent before, we certainly do now. Um, And so that's the fun part. That's where the good stuff is. But uh, that getting uncomfortable for our student athletes is where we try to, we try to base all of our learning. And then obviously the game of volleyball is a, a game of errors in a lot of ways. So, navigating our relationship with failure so and this frankly it's the same thing it's the same conversation just different a little different language and different stage when you're talking to a ceo or an organization um so it's integrative i love it that makes a lot of sense i'm I'm kind of thinking of right now in, in my head about how much your student athletes must much gain this as a person by the time they go through your your program you know sports or learning about competition and working as a team but then the kind of the zen aspect the uh let's say phil jackson phil jackson zen moment if you will where you're bringing in the journaling you're bringing in you know kind of being the moment and that's that's awesome i think i think probably a lot of your students kind of what i've read from from your website and some other information that they've really appreciated that and then they've gone on to do great big things and they still reach out to you and have this connection because you kind of mentor them through their uh, younger younger self and then kind of growing into this kind of you know adult right. uh, and so that's that's got to be that's also got to be very uh, fulfilling for you. Yeah, it's great. That's my favorite part. You know, when um, you know when I just had a player reach out to me last week that. Um, you know, wants to get back and play professionally and she's been off for years and is getting married and another one I got to meet who's having her second child and, and going through all that. And, um, it's been, yeah, it's, it's, it is the cool part. And I think, um, you know, hopefully, you know, you're not going to connect with everyone. Um, and I think any good coach, you know, feels that he feels that pain. Um, it's one of the hard parts of our job is, is, um, is sometimes when you just can't quite make that connection with someone. But I do think, you know, the stuff we're talking about and, and the players coming back and talking to you and leaning in and, and sharing their stories and spending time with their children and all that, I've been doing it long enough to know that that, to be able to do that, thankfully. But yeah, it's really, it's really rewarding. It's, and it's the best part of the job. 
the other thing, the other thing I want to ask you was, as you mentioned earlier, you're as a coach, it's, it takes a lot out of you, you know, physically, mentally, um, it's, it's a drain. And then you have, you have a family with, with three young boys. So that's, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a lot too. So how do you, how do you find time for yourself, your internal self, um, through, you know, meditation, exercise, whatever it is, what do you do to kind of stay grounded? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I would say <laughs> I did not do a great job of this five, six, seven years ago. Um, and it's, you know, it's a work in progress, right? I think for me, I, I really, I've, and this is through, frankly, um, being let go and getting fired. Um, and having that time through COVID, I've had the time to take a deep breath and slow down the film, so to speak. And, um, for me, I really look at energy. Like I, I think about, okay, where do I want to put my energy? Um, and what's sacred to me, right? And I think most of us and certainly most men, the me time always is last, you know, the, we just don't look at taking care of ourselves as sacred. Um, and that's something that we're trying to change. Um, it doesn't have to be this or this, it's gotta be a this and this. Um, so for me, you know, obviously my, my marriage is sacred. My, 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 my three boys are sacred. And then I need to, I want to spend time one-on-one -on -one with all three of them because for it's crazy. I think they all three came from the same place because they're completely different animals, right? So I want to spend that sacred to me to spend time with them, but also one-on-one -on -one time. Epic Journey Leadership is something that I'm really passionate about and helping helping people and CEOs and and other leaders navigate um, these these rough waters and and coming out the other end better for it. And certainly college coaching, um, you know, pouring myself into our student athletes. And so, and then you have to carve out time for yourself. And so for me, um, I do that. I have a, I am a, I have every week I lay out color coded and I'm still an old school pencil and paper guy and I do it every Sunday and I carve out time where I'm going to, I'm going to coach other people through Epic Journey and I, and I carve out time where I'm going to meditate and I carve out time or I'm going to go for a walk and do some exercise. That's, that's just me. I really enjoy solitude. Um, for me to pour myself into my players, my clients, my family, my kids, I know I have to recharge my batteries. Um, and my wife knows that. I'm very, very lucky to have a wife that understands that and is extremely patient and deals with my crap. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, you have to, for me, it, I just I put it under sacred time, and, and you only have so much water in the bucket. And if you're going to spend three fourths of that on stuff that doesn't matter and waste energy, uh, you only have a quarter of that bucket left for the things that matter, um, which you know your family and yourself and other things that are important. So I'm doing better at carving the fat, if you will, and and really for me, it's about energy and what's sacred, and then pouring myself into those things. And one of those buckets has to be me having solitude. Um, and everyone's going to be a little bit different. Some people's going to be playing music. Some people's going to go for a hike. I do all those sort of things. But I need to, if I don't put it down in my, if I don't carve it out, it's not going to happen. So I, I do a pretty good job of, of setting aside time that I, I don't have anything. And it's just, frankly, my own time to do what I need to do. The last question I want to ask you, what book, what's like the, the number one book you give to your students mm -hmm. to read and why? That's actually a hard question and an easy question because there's so many, but there's one book that got me through a lot and that I recommend to everyone. And it's, and it's um, called When Things Fall Apart by Pema Chodron. Um, she is a 80-something-year-old Buddhist nun and her ability to simplify Buddhism in a very workable, tangential, like just absolutely clear, clean, simple way. Um, really, it's a, essentially it's a it's a it's a guidebook for how to navigate pain and stress and all the emotions. And it's beautiful. It is my favorite book. 
I have it in my backpack. It's with me all the time. So, yeah, when things fall apart, uh, written by Pema Chodron, anything by Pema Chodron is great. But that book is is the one that I've that I like the most. Well, I appreciate that. I'll I will add that to my library list. Yes. Where can people find you online and learn more about uh, your Epic Journey program? Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, well, I'm on LinkedIn, Epic, just under my name, uh, Jeff Carlston. So it's G E O F F C A R L S T O N. So it sounds like a simple name, but it's not. Um, my website is epicjourneyleadership.com. And then, you know, if you look up my name or Epic Journey Leadership, it's going to pop up in multiple places. So Facebook and I haven't quite done the Instagram yet, but um, certainly on LinkedIn and and the website. And then you know you can you can get a hold of me. My you know my email is uh, Carpe Carlston, so C A R P E C A R L S T O N at gmail dot com. That's a shout out to Carpe Diem, right? So um, yeah, seize the day. Yep. Yeah, seize the day. So um, yeah, I love I love to have these conversations. Um, culture and organizations working with CEOs, helping people navigate, you know, we all get stuck, you know, that's the reality. It's, I always joke if we're, if everyone's broken, then maybe no one's broken, you know, if we just don't talk about it. Right. So we all feel like we're broken. We got this, we got that. And even if we think we got our stuff together, the reality is we, none of us do. Um, and some of us are doing a better job with it and navigating it, but man, we can all use, we can all use someone to kind of kind of help us navigate this because we all have blind spots. We all get stuck. Um, we all have things that caves that we really haven't explored. And so um, that's the good stuff. So I love doing that with my college students and I really have enjoyed doing it with some older people um, that are, that are maybe in that, that, that leadership position and feeling a little bit, feel a little bit alone in trying to navigate what their next mountain is. So I appreciate your time by the way, for letting me, have me come out here and talk about this stuff. It's important. Yeah, this is awesome. I have many more questions, but I'm going to respect your time. I always end the show with remember you're not alone in life or business. Love it. <laughs>